Evening, everybody. Uh, I think we're going to start. It's now uh, slightly after 6.30. I would like to call to order the Town of Cohasset Conservation Meeting. Today is the 19th of November, 2020. The time is 6.30, and we are holding the meeting uh, remotely via the Zoom platform. In attendance this evening are Angela Giso, our Conservation Administrator. Here. Jeff yep, Summers. Yep. Conservation yep. agent, Jeff's here. Yep, you have Kathy to do a roll call vote. Yeah, so uh, we can do the roll call now. Yeah, no, all they have to say is aye, that's it. And then we know they're there. Present. Kathy Berrigan. Present. Myself, Eric Eisenhower, present. Uh, Patricia Grady. Present. Eden. Chris McFarland. Here. Jay Pimpare. Present. James, Ro uh, James Roseback. Present. Marianne Weatherold. Present. Tom Bell, I think, is not here yet or won't be here this evening. And Heather Seitz, our assistant commissioner, associate commissioner. I'm present. Great. So we have a quorum of uh, six tonight, seven, seven this evening. Since the meeting is being conducted remotely, we will do all votes by roll call in alphabetical order. Um, we've already gone through and the people who are here have notified it by answering yes, so we don't need to go through that now. As I said, we have a quorum of seven. Uh, anyone in the audience listening who would like to address any of the applications, you will need to check the chat box on your screen. Our agent, Jeff Summers, will be monitoring the chat box and any questions indicated. Jeff, could you just review where the information is and uh, any other Zoom technology issues that we should inform in, uh, the audience of? Um, yeah, so you mentioned that, you know, if anybody in the audience wants to make any comments, just do so through the, um, the Q&A. And um, I'll do my best to keep an eye on that. Um, Chris McFarlane, I'm also going to um, give you um, um, host privileges just in case something happens and I fall off or, or something happens, just so you'll have the ability to do that. Um, or make you co-host. Um, let me do that now. Anything else, Jeff, or is that uh, it? Well, I was just going to say, too, if um, anybody in the audience wants to look at um, the permit applications, um, if they can't see them on screen, if they go to the town website um, and then scroll down to the bottom of the page, there's a virtual meeting information section. If you click on that, um, what will come up is just below that is the um, tonight's Conservation Commission meeting, and it will have all of the documents um, loaded there. Big improvement. Thanks, everyone. I'm not sure who did that, Jeff, but uh, that's very helpful. Um, Tom, I see you're there now. Welcome. Good to see you. Uh, Tom Bell is here. Could you, uh, in terms of being present, could you just answer I, please? Tom? Tom Bell, I. Thank you very much for the record. Okay. First item on the agenda this evening. Is... Mr. Commissioner, Mr. Yes, Chair, can I make just a quick comment? Yeah. Go uh, ahead. Uh, just looking at the agenda, if we want to make an announcement that a couple of the hearings are actually have been continued for two weeks yeah. out. So if there are any, uh, any attendees or any participants that are um, well, I'll let you go if you want to talk about the continuance of the two hearings. Okay. Uh, we have actually three continuances this evening. Uh, so if anyone's in the audience who's waiting for any of the following, uh, please understand they will be continued to the 3rd of December. That's RDA 20 slash 12, 11 James Lane, NOI 20 slash 20, 183, 187 Atlantic Avenue, has been also continued, and NOI 2021, Stormwater Permit 2029, Lot C, Dolan Lane, has also been continued to the 3rd of December. So if you're, if you're here for those, um, you're welcome to stay. We'd love to have an audience, all right? The, uh, the more the merrier, but uh, we will not be discussing the, any issues related to those this evening. All right. Um, okay. Uh, in place of RDA 20-12, we have a period of 20 minutes. I propose that we discuss some work that, that Jeff and I have done 
in terms of um, a discussion we had in the past as to how we better organize the paperwork and the decision taking on minor maintenance projects. Uh, in the past, they've been related to problems with uh, with boundaries between properties. And Jeff has uh, put some thoughts to paper and we can discuss those this evening. We won't be taking a final decision, decision this evening. It has to go through legal counsel, but we can discuss it in the spare time that we have about 20 minutes or so. So this evening we begin with RDA 20 11605 Jerusalem Road drywall system, Mr. Gardner and Brands. We have someone to represent them this evening. Anyone here? Uh, it's, uh, Greg Morris is here. Okay. Greg? Good, good, good evening. Good evening. So thank you. For the record, my name is Gregory Morris. I'm a registered engineer with Morris Engineering. I'm representing the property owners tonight, David Gardner and Deborah Brams. We had filed a request for determination of applicability for some work inside of the buffer zone to Straits Pond. Um, mm -hmm. The property, as you look at the site plan, um, Jerusalem Road is kind of at the, the bottom of the page. Straits Pond is at the top of the page. The site is about half an acre. It's developed with the existing home and an existing driveway. Um, the proposal that brings us in front of you, there are several additions that are proposed on the home. Those additions, however, are all outside of the 100 foot buffer zone. Straits Pond at the back of the page, the 100 foot buffer zone to it extends well up toward the house. It's the green line that's the yeah. cursor is running along. We have filed, associated with the house, we had filed a stormwater permit. It was a category one permit for the additions. Um, and that was issued through your department. However, the dry wells for that, which you'll see in the middle of the page there, are located inside the 100 foot buffer zone partially. They're 90 feet away from Straits Pond. They're in an area that's existing lawn surface. There are no trees coming down as part of this project. Um, the area that um, the dry wells are going, again, is existing lawn. It would be restored as lawn. Uh, and we have an erosion control barrier in place. Uh, the work at its closest distance is 80 feet from the edge of the pond. And again, it's the installation of dry wells for the roof gutter system. I turn it over to you. Jeff, do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, just so as Greg said, you know, so, so we're looking here, the resource area, Straits Pond, which is back here, um, for, right from the edge of Straits Pond all the way up to the back of the house is all lawn. Um, and you can see it here in this photo. So you have lawn all the way up to the back of the house, pretty much right here in the foreground um, is where they're proposing to put the infiltration chamber, which is um, the stormwater mitigation for this um, addition project. Um, as Greg said, the uh, stormwater permit for this was issued administratively. It didn't trigger a um, stormwater permit reviewed by the commission. The, um, Increase in impervious surface with this addition was about 750 square feet. Um, so, because, and as Greg said, because the um, infiltration chamber is within the 100 foot buffer zone, and then also, also in the RDA, they mentioned this uh, post hole right here, which is actually in the floodplain, which is jurisdictional. Yep. Um, that is that is the reason why this RDA is in front of us. So, um, but just to reiterate, it's all lawn right here. There's no trees, no vegetation being removed. Once this is in, the lawn will be restored as is. Any comments, anybody? Yes. Um, as you mentioned, the the post is in the floodplain, but so is the fill area for the uh, for the drywall system. So, if if I'm not mistaken because this is land subject to flooding, the, the addition of fill material in that area would, all, would require a uh, kind of a, a cut fill situation for something like this. Am I, not, am I incorrect or am I correct on that? It's technically it's classified as land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, so it does not require a compensatory flood storage analysis. Um, if this was an inland floodplain, that absolutely would be required, but because it borders on a coastal resource, uh, that's not the case. So Straits Pond is considered a coastal resource? 
Yes, it is. Okay. Greg, a uh, question. Uh, it looks like the fill in the back ad is coming up about a foot, maybe a foot and a half for the infiltration chambers. Uh, assuming that you're not going to hit any groundwater uh, over there in, the, in that area there, it looks like maybe the infiltration chambers would actually probably only be going down maybe a foot and a half to two feet or so and when you're bringing in the fill there. But any issues with the groundwater table? Not, not that we expect. We expect the groundwater there is going to be down about two feet in depth um, at, at its highest point. And so the infiltrators um, being two feet above that, uh, the infiltrators are a foot high in elevation. And then you put typically uh, nine inches or so of fill over it. So you're right. We are bringing in fill in that area. It's about one and a half feet of fill. I don't expect there to be any groundwater issues at that location, no. Anybody else, any comments? Do we have a motion to approve? Is this uh, Jeff Summers, it would just, do this be just a regular negative two determination? Yes. Uh, Jay Pampara would like to make a motion to approve, uh, issue uh, a negative two determination for the RDA at 605 Jerusalem Road. Jay, Jay I'm sorry, before, before you do that, is there any, were there any comments? Jeff? Oh yeah, sorry from the, um, no, there's none. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank sorry. you, Chris. In that case, I second. Okay, we'll go through a roll call vote. Uh, Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, yay. Eric Eisenhower, yay. Patricia Grady. Patricia Grady, um, yay. Yeah. Chris McFarland. Chris McFarland, yay. Jay Pimpare. Yay. James Roseback. James Roseback, yay. Okay, thank you. Yay. That's, that's good to hear, Jeff. Marianne Weatherald. Marianne Weatherald, yay. Okay. That's uh, seven positive yays, uh, no abstentions, and no negative votes. So it passes seven nothing. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. Have a good night. Good luck with your project. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. No. Uh, we have a bit of time here. Uh, 6.50, we're scheduled for Lambert's Lane. So we have about ooh, oh, five to 10 minutes. And maybe we can discuss a situation that came up at the last meeting. Jeff's done some work on it. And this will at least, at least give you the background. Uh, as I said before, we have to make something in writing to uh, Karis North, our legal attorney. And um, so we won't be able to vote on it. We won't be able to probably propose anything final tonight. But it deals with the the letter that most of the members of the uh, Conservation Commission received from a resident who lives on Nichols Road, who complained about some trees being cut down on the property. This is what, three or four weeks ago. Uh, they were his trees, they were cut down by a neighbor. Um, this was something which was uh, unfortunate and very, very upsetting to the owner of the property. It was a, 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 an act of removal of trees, which was not authorized. And um, it was a violation of wetland regulations. Now, uh, there was some, a lot of, lot of uncertainty here. It was all carried out and no one was sure whether the border was, whether it was on the individual's land or the, excuse me, the uh, offender's land who cut the tree or the owner of the land who had his trees cut. There was vagueness on that. Um, there were, we, lacked, we lacked a drawing as to where the trees were. From an evidence viewpoint, it, it was very hard to put the whole thing together afterwards to determine responsibility. And it gets down to the, I think the procedures that we have, which are rather uh, loose and not substantive in terms of, uh, of what people are allowed to do in this area of uh, what I would call uh, wetlands maintenance. It's not serious enough to get to the level of an NOI, but it's serious enough to get Jeff involved because it's not minor, it's not mowing a lawn. Um, but in the end, we ended up with uh, little in the way of, of drawings and, and uh, pieces of material to come back and say, yes, that, that tree was there and that tree was there and it shouldn't have been cut. 
So it was all a bit um, unsubstantiated, unfortunately. So the idea was that Jeff would go back and uh, take a look at our regulations and try and put together something that should beef up um, the protocol that we have. So when we go through and uh, conduct these, what I would call less than NOI maintenance actions, uh, we have some, some photographs, drawings, we're assured that the abutters know what's going on and various things like that. Jeff has put together something uh, in writing. Like I said, it's tentative. We're presenting it now just so we can get your points of view on it because um, at this stage, like I said, we, we don't have anything final yet to vote on. Jeff, do you want to take it over and, and, and uh, let the commissioners know where we stand? Um, yeah, so, so this has to do with... Um, <clears throat> Uh, let me just get it up here a second. Uh, so this is basically what ta the, the part we we're talking about where it, it speaks about buffer zones, landscape and clearing of vegetation. Um, so, you know, it's talking about minor, you know, minor projects where people want to, um, you know, remove dead trees or remove a couple trees or, this tree looks sick and I, I want to take it down. Um, so it says, um, you know, well, I'll just read it out. It says, um, it is not the intent of the, Co of the Cohasset wetland regulations to bring any and all landscaping projects within its jurisdiction. For example, routine uh, non-clearing maintenance of existing landscape is not subject to commission review, but are subject to review by the commission, uh, Conservation Commission agent. Nevertheless, landscaping activities often <clears throat> involve clearing, cutting, and re-engineering of vegetation, and regulation and guidelines are required to ensure that these well-intended projects do not adversely impact upon resource areas or um, protected interests, so our wetlands or, or whatever it may be. So, based, so you know, we, we talked about this, or I talked about this with Karis North, our attorney, and her suggestion was, as we had, you know, Eric and uh, Jay, and, you know, we had a preliminary conversation about what do, what do we think we should do. And uh, basically what we thought was, you know, have homeowners um, file a permit application for the work. Um, and, you know, part of Karis's um, reasoning was that it makes it fair to everybody because, you know, somebody might call me up and say, hey, I want to take these three trees down. And I'm like, okay, you can do that. They're, they're, they're dying. And then somebody else might come down and say, hey, I want to take these 10 trees down. They're dying. So, you know, where, where does, where's the, um, you know, it's, it's all discretionary from, you know, my point of view. Okay, well, this I can approve, um, you know, administratively while, you know, I don't know, this is a lot of work down here. I, I'm going to say you need to have a permit. So, you know, Karis, her logic was just make everybody file a permit. So, you know, just to change this in the uh, rules and regulations, um, you know, I just kind of, the, you know, so this is, this is the way it's written now up top, uh, you know, a, a proposed change, you know, I just simply added a, a sentence um, that talks about the um, so, okay, so up here we have, you know, the maintenance of existing landscaping, that's fine, you know, you can trim your bushes and um, cut the dead limbs out of your trees and mow your lawn, etc. Um, but then it talks more about clearing, cutting and re-engineering. So, you know, I'm going to take these three dead trees out and put in, you know, something else. Um, you know, have the commission review this work to um, in ensure that it goes as planned. So, Basically, you know, the, the, the simple thing that I did was just added one sentence that says, therefore, these types of projects shall require the filing of a permit application um, when proposed within a resource area or buffer zone. And I would actually change that to a, a, a wetland permit application. So yeah, do you have a copy of the wording that I gave you? Um, yeah. I think we have to go a bit further than that. That's my feeling. Hey, I think this is a, it's a great uh, start at something. I'm, I'm happy to uh, 
to add some comments to it. Uh, one of the things I, I think what, of course, we'd have to get town council uh, weigh in, but this would probably have to go to uh, town meeting to for approval anytime we make changes to the wetlands rules and regulations. And if we're going to make some changes, then we should look at the wetlands rules and regulations um, in general to see if there are any other uh, areas that need to be addressed. I know we've talked about some other areas in the past few years. So uh, I think it's certainly something to, to look at and, and certainly talk about. Um, just something to keep in the back of your mind on whether or not this needs to go to town meeting and get voted upon by the citizens of Cohasset, which I believe it would. Yeah, Jay, um, I, I think I, I asked Karis this and, the, you know, I haven't heard back from her yet, but um, uh, so if it was if it were a bylaw change, I think that is what would be required to go to town meeting. If it's a change of rules and regulations, I think it, I think the commission can change them at their discretion with a majority vote. Um, that's something that I wanted to confirm with her, but I, I believe that's how it is. Um, the, the, the bylaw actually states that the commission will draft its own rules and regulations. Um, so I, I think that can be changed at will with the majority vote, but I think it's just the actual changes of the bylaw itself that would require um, uh, it to go before town meeting and be approved. Yeah, I, I, I certainly would like to uh, get town council weigh in on that because just to give you a clear example, if we decided as a total example to change the no disturbance zone from 50 feet to 100 feet, just getting a majority vote between seven members uh, or uh, amongst the seven members to change, for instance, for an example, the no disturbance zone, that would be an incredibly uh, bold move on the part of the commission. So I don't know whether that would fly across the entire town, but nevertheless, um, uh, I know I'm not the chair here, but I know we have a, a, a hearing at 630. So it might be good to circle back to that. And just administratively, we need to open up 11 James Lane uh, and continue that right away. Read that into the record and continue that before we get to 76 Lamberts. Okay. You know, Jay, I, as far as the rules, you know, and uh, what's going on, it, it was my point of view that in the, the version we had, we wanted to give a bit more detail as to what routine maintenance was. A few examples so to give a better idea. And then what we do is we would use the already established RDA procedure, all right, yeah. uh, for these, these other cases. And it would be basically the same RDA, Jay. We're not talking about beefing it up or changing it. We're just maybe talking yeah. about expanding uh, the use of the RDA, all right, in this situation. So, but we'll check yeah, no, it in any case. Yeah, I, I completely agree with the with your approach and uh, concept moving forward. I think it's a great idea. I think okay. this is a really good start. I'm looking at the section 27 that you addressed, and I do see it goes further, and then it goes into pruning, lifting, clear cutting, and Vista pruning, which I think Vista pruning is probably the most, um, it, it, we get a lot, there's a lot of Vista pruning, I think. So I think we have to explain, explain um, this, this change more that we're, yeah. so it needs a little more addressing. The idea so far, Marianne, was not to, to deal with those five things of, of Vista pruning and the other things that are listed there. But just to deal with this this whole question of uh, of a procedure for the what I would call uh, low level maintenance, because we got involved in this case because it was considered that what the person was doing was relatively routine maintenance, and it turned out he wanted to do a lot more, and he did a lot more than routine maintenance. And what we need to do, in, in looking back in, in retrospect, is get some paperwork, some diagrams. You need to mark the trees. You need to agree upon where the, the boundary is and all that. Use of the RDA would accomplish that, Marianne. Whether we go back and rewrite the whole thing, I think, depends on our discussion with Karis, all right? But, no, yeah. I'm, in, I'm in agreement with that. I think people don't understand. Like, both parties, and butters, should know where the property lines are if you get some tree trimming. I think that would be a natural step. Um, yeah. But I guess you have to write, we have to clearly write that out so people are reminded of the little steps that make a big difference but you know it um in my own my own experience uh the number of times we've handled things informally 
that's been involved in cutting things back. I, when the person explains what he wants to do, and then you actually go back and look at it two days later, there's invariably a lot more eliminated and removed than what we thought the guy was going to do. And very often we don't have a document or anything substantive to say, hey, uh, you, you did a lot more than what was agreed to. You know, it's just too uh, airy-fairy, uh, too informal. So we're trying to formalize it here and uh, we'll meet with Karis on this and hope to have something you know, a, a greater detail to propose at the next meeting. Okay, now, uh, moving along, uh, James Lane's along, we're, we're getting on to NOI 20-19, stormwater permit 20-2676, Lambert's Lane, which I think we're all pretty familiar with. Mr. Chair, I think you need to read into the record the James Lane and then formally continue that. Oh, oh we do? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's 640 RDA 20 hyphen 12, 11, James Lane, small additions, Kenny. Uh, we are going to formally um, uh, continue that to the 3rd of December, uh, 2020. All right, do we have to vote on that, Jay? No, you're good. Okay. Yeah. Next is our NOI uh, 2019 uh, Lambert's Lane, which I introduced before, sports court. Mr. Marchetti continued from uh, the 5th of uh, November of this year. Um, and I turn it over to Mr. Marchetti and his team. Mr. Uh, Chairman, just, just a reminder, I've recused myself from this hearing. Fine, thank you, Chris. Thanks for reminding us. So we're down to six. Okay, Carl Lamb, I see your, I see your photograph there. Um, Mr. Chairman, I just say that um, I wasn't at the last meeting on November 5th. However, I did try to listen to the audio of it, but the town has not placed it on the system because of COVID. They are now putting video audio on and it hasn't been posted. And I did speak to Angela about this today, but I don't, I'm not sure if you want me to participate or not. I think uh, I don't, I have no problem with you participating, Cara. Um, I think um, we're getting to the end of this end of this project at this stage, and um, I think in the area that you're responsible, I think things are probably not not too controversial. Um, so okay, I, I just I'm wanted happy to, to have you participate. I just wanted to get that out there. Thank you. Okay, so Steve, do you want to uh, pick up the ball and run with it? Sure. Uh, good evening. For the record, Steve Gioso with SciTech and representing the applicant this evening with me tonight is Kara Lamb, the uh, landscape architect for the project. Um, after the last meeting, um, we made a couple of additional modifications to the plan, primarily Kara's um, good work on improving the buffer plantings and relocating some of the features uh, on the site to get some better separation to the resource area and the 50 foot no disturb zone. Uh, most importantly, the um, uh, play area has been moved an additional 20 feet away from the uh, resource area. And the elevated uh, planting beds have also been relocated uh, a little bit further away from the resource area. And I think the primary changes beyond that are both my plan and Kara's plan are now aligned. I think there was a couple of little discrepancies the last time. And also she has um, expanded the restoration planting to an area that uh, is not a recent alteration area, but we thought that it was a way to offset um, some of the alteration that did occur uh, without a permit and expanded that to an area opposite the garage and driveway area where it has historically been a, a lawn area, or at least in the in the not too distant past and is now she has bolstered that with some significant additional plantings in the outer uh, 50 foot zone. So I, I'm going to let Kara explain the changes on the plantings, but I think in the end what we've done is taken a harder look at the restoration plantings, expanded the area to create some additional mitigation into areas that uh, were not previously um, uh, altered in this uh, current setting. And I think we relocated some of the features to um, 
get them a little further from the resource area. The, the sport court is out of the 50-foot uh, no-touch zone now. Um, we are still proposing the drainage system around the entire perimeter with Cultec units and crushed stone. Uh, so we have uh, proper mitigation for the stormwater, for stormwater management from that impervious surface plus the any of the additional alteration areas. So I think the drainage balances, and I think I'll turn it over to Kara to discuss more specifically the planting uh, elements of the project. Thanks, Steve. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Oh, perfect. Um, so the plantings, uh, currently we have, um, we've bolstered the plantings significantly. Uh, currently we now have um, 77 native tree plantings uh, for the site. Um, let's see if I can screen share. Let's see. Does everyone see this uh, diagram that I've drawn? Um, yes. So I wanted to show you this diagram because it really shows how much area we are now adding to the restoration planting. So this area that's in um, blue is what will be replanted. Uh, purple here and underneath this zone, which is not really showing up, this is the court. In orange is the playset area and in yellow is the garden. Um, so what remains is um, this green area off to the side and the blue area between the court, between the play set and the, and the vegetable garden. Um, we will be adding, um, in, in the end, after everything is built, there will actually be a net gain in habitat, wildlife, um, wildlife habitat of 2,383 um, square feet. Um, and then I'm actually gonna give Brendan the microphone now because Brendan is our head arborist at Skyline Landscapes and he can speak to the varieties of trees that, that have been selected um, and, and also the, the value they provide for habitat. Hi, thanks, Kara. Um, yeah, so I guess uh, to introduce myself, I'll be the one who's uh, actually responsible for implementing the planting, uh, Kara's design, uh, myself and my team. So I guess I'm generally available to answer questions that you have about the actual physical planting of the plants and what is what it entails. Um, but I think the plant selection is fairly straightforward and we, we just tried to mimic, you know, what the surrounding species of trees and shrubs were in the area. Um, and I mean, essentially that's, that's it. We, we, tried to maximize the amount of plantings that we could put into the area and keep it consistent with what we think is around uh, the general forest in that area. So that's, I, I don't know if there are specific questions, uh, but I'm, I'm able to answer them if, if, if you'd like. Jeff, Jeff, before we turn it over to the commissioners, uh, what, do you have anything you'd like to add, Jeff? Um, well, just that, so, you know, the other day, um, Eric and I went out to take a look at the site again, and we determined that, you know, there was um, the, the, the last revision um, had mitigation plantings. Everything was uh, west of the um, uh, wildlife habitat easement line. Um, you know, we took a look at it again, and, and we were kind of were thinking that there was an opportunity for further plantings in that area because it looked like there was a lot of disturbed areas uh, and empty pockets. Um, so, uh, you know, I called um, Kara that afternoon and we spoke and um, she was able to um, put in another, I think it was uh, 20 um, trees along that line. So that was a significant increase from the prior proposal that we had a few days ago. And that's all. Commissioners, any any comments? Yeah, this is uh, this is Jay Pimpara here. I I think that the, this landscape plan has certainly come a long, long way here. 
with respect to um and can we actually put up the other um i don't know who's looks like uh, kara still has the screen here can we put up the other diagram of the landscape plan showing the tennis court and the other um an actual depiction of the trees etc on the property um if you are you do you mean something that are not not the actual, I, yeah, the actual landscape plan. I mean, I have it right here in front of me on my screen. Um, ha happy to grab control of it, or Jeff can just put it up. It's the actual yeah. landscape plan. What we just switched from, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Or you have the, the details of the trees. Right. Um, can everybody see my screen? Or yeah, we can see your screen, but but we're looking at the. It looks like a, maybe an older picture with the blue green. I just want to see the picture with the actual tennis court outlined on there. There is a formal landscape plan uh, separate from this one. Um, Jeff, yeah, it's this one. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. So um, again, I, I think that there's. Um, as you mentioned, roughly a 2,000 square foot uh, addition of landscaping within the uh, wetland easement area. You know, looking at this plan, it certainly looks like there's an abundance of uh, trees, et cetera, in there. They're native trees. And I'm sure that it's, um, you know, when you look at the plan, they're, they're, they're kind of just, I don't know, they're nice and formal and they're in nice rows, et cetera. My question is that when they actually planted, would they be like randomly planted out there as opposed to just like every three feet you throw a tree in so it doesn't look like it's like a Christmas tree farm out there, et cetera? Would there be some random placement um, as opposed to, again, like every six feet, every three feet for the trees that are right along the wetland easement area, a wildlife easement area, excuse me? Sure. Um, yeah, I can take that question. Uh, I think a lot of it will have to do with kind of the specific, um, I guess, topography of, of the site. Obviously, there's ledge and in, in different pockets. Um, and they they definitely will not be planted in straight rows as as kind of shown on the plan. Uh, there will be some variation there. Um, but generally speaking, we will try to follow uh, certainly the locations uh, yeah. as closely as possible yes okay brendan i i was out there with jeff i can confirm what you just said there's no way you're going to put those trees in a line when you look at the big stumps that are there you look at the ledge outcroppings you're probably going to have a, a, a difficult time getting 20 trees in there at all and have enough root space and, and that type of thing so they're going to they're going to be what I would call very randomly placed in the end, I believe, all right? And they won't be in a line. Um, does this diagram tie in with the other diagram, Cara? Remember the one where we had the green and blue areas? Yes. Is, the, is, do these tie in together? Um, well, the, this diagram here shows tree, the trees that were removed, areas of disturbance. Um, okay. so, so these blue trees, this is what I believe was there prior to the clearing, just yep. because I, I was not hired prior to this. Um, so this this was the di diagram that you had requested um, okay. a month ago, which uh, showed how much yeah. clearing had been completed. Yeah. So yeah, you know, Jeff and I were there two days ago and we looked at this area on the right in the middle where the, the emerald green is. I think that's the area, it's kind of hard because you think, it's kind of hard to tell where, where we were in relation to this, but we want to make sure that the area where the large trees were cut down are repopulated with the trees you're putting in now, all right? That's the essence, all right, of the mitigation program. You know, where the, you know, there's a lot of material that was taken out, and I think that's what you've done here. I'd just like to have you confirm that, Cara, all right? Um, because there are about 20 trees, uh, very similar to the number you're talking about, in terms of the density that clearly were removed. And I think that's those 20 are the ones you're putting back in. If that's the case, then I, I think it's, it's fairly acceptable. Um, yes, I've, I've tried my best to determine how many trees could possibly fit here. Um, yeah, okay. I think we've maximized it. <laughs> All right. 
Oh, can you roll to the top of the screen, please, of that plan? So is are will there be mature trees at the abutters line there? So, I mean, eventually they will become mature, but um, they're going to be fairly new trees. They're going to be smaller trees when planted. Uh -huh. Aest aesthetically, do you think um, these trees will will shade the light from the 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 court lights from the abutters? I'm concerned about that. Um, I'm going to let Brendan answer that question because these are pitch pines, um, and uh -huh. Brendan can describe the growth and habit of them. Okay. Um, I would say initially this planting is relatively small um, in size. And that is partially due to the fact um, that there's a lack of soil uh, needed to plant mature trees. Um, and so in lieu of bringing in large, very large quantities of non-native soils, we've gone the route of uh, using a, a smaller size tree initially. Um, so at, at, at the outside of the project, it, it, the trees up there are probably not going to provide uh, a whole lot of coverage for light. Um, if that is something that um, needs to be addressed, we could certainly attempt to plant larger trees in that specific location. Um, just probably won't be possible to make the entire planting um, mature sized. Is it possible to do a combination of mature and smaller size to to, kind of, to thicken up the density over there? In that location, uh, that is possible, yes. Could you con please consider that? Absolutely. Yeah, for the three or four to the left-hand side. The key to success, I think Brendan, the key to success of that row there will be being well watered in the summertime. If you don't water well, those trees will be gone in a matter of a month, okay? So I assume you're going to have ample irrigation? Yeah, we'll probably end up tapping into the existing irrigation system yeah. uh, that's already, it's actually already set up, um, I believe, adjacent to that area where there's some, some other new plantings. Any other comments? Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe there was a comment that we received. I know I received a copy of an email from an abutter um, that maybe should be addressed uh, this evening. Um, I don't know, maybe Jeff Summers, would you wanna talk about that and just give an overview about the public comment that was received or was submitted to the commission, I should say, with respect to the setbacks, albeit, may not be within Conservation Commission's jurisdiction. We can talk a little bit about that, but I think we should at least formally acknowledge the public comment that uh, that did come in. Yeah, thanks, Jay. I was gonna bring that up before this closed. Um, so I, I received a, a, an email from one of the neighbors who was concerned about um, a zoning issue. Um, so, um, you know, they're, they're saying that the actual setback here as far as zoning goes is a 20 foot setback as opposed to the six. Um, so, you know, what, what we did, um, or I should say, you know, what I did was, uh, you know, when this issue came up was I talked to Bob Egan, who's the building commissioner, and he's also the zoning enforcement officer. And I said, you know, what is the actual setback for the um, court to this property line. And his answer was six feet. And that's what the applicant is proposing here. Um, so, so if there is actually a zoning issue here, I mean, it really isn't up for the Conservation Commission to determine. Um, you know, we're looking at the plantings, the stormwater, the buffer zones, et cetera. Um, zoning issues would really have to be determined by the zoning board. So, the if there is actually a zoning issue here um 
the opportunity to have that settled would be when the when the building or if the building permit for the court is issued by the building department, that would be the time um, that someone would uh, challenge the building permit based on um, you know, what they believe the zoning issue, uh, zoning regulations are. Um, and if it came to it, you know, the zoning board of appeals would make a final determination. Um, so, you know, we did, we did a preliminary, um, uh, I don't want to call it an investigation, but, you know, I, I spoke with the zoning enforcement officer. He said it's six feet. That's what they have here. Um, I think beyond that, um, it, it would actually have to go to the zoning board for a final determination. Uh, to add to that, Jeff, I did look into that as well about the six feet versus 20 feet because yeah. I thought it might be 20 and I had come up with six feet and there's a case from 1982 of Lowry Bell Jr. versus the Zoning Board of Appeals in Cohasset about this actual discussion of a tennis court and the conclusion was it can be six, it is six feet away from the boundary line. And they can reference Thank you. that. All right. Yeah, that, that, uh, the, thanks, Marion. I was not aware of that one. Um, I, I, I would say I think that it's certainly something to look into. Uh, again, I wanted to make sure that was noted for the record. It's, as Jeff mentioned, not within conservation's uh, jurisdiction to look at that. I, I do think that it's there potentially could be a zoning issue. It sounds like there may be a decision already on the record. When we talk about structures and look at things, when you look at the definition of a structure, uh, clearly a tennis court and or a fence greater than six feet is considered a structure. So there's clearly there's a, uh, a, again, tennis court meets a definition of a structure. I think it should be continued to further uh, be further looked at, but as long as we've got it on the record, um, then, then great. And thanks for Marianne for doing that legwork. Great job. Legal Eagle. Good research, Marianne. Oh, well, I think it's up to them to, I mean, that's not a conservation issue. It is a zoning, so yeah. they should look into that. But just that we, it was of concern and um, we take concerns seriously. Thank you, Mary. Um, okay. Thank so, you. Mr. Chair, have, uh, I know you and, and the agent went out to look at the site. Are you, uh, are you uh, satisfied with the placement of the trees to uh, mitigate the, uh, I'll say, removal of the of the exist of the trees that were previously in the area there, along that wildlife easement area, etc. What one of the problems is when you walk around there, um, and then you know you you have certain landmarks like the fence, the pool fence, and you can see where that is, and you can see the depth. Of where the trees have been cut. And then I see Kara's diagram. And I think, well, I hope the two match up, but I'm not entirely sure. All right. You know, there's a good, the, the trees going in a good 20 feet from what I would call the, the, uh, the edge of where the stone's been put in. There have been a lot of trees cut. And I, I'm assuming that that 20 feet is the green area that you have on your diagram, Kara. All right, so that the the trees that you're putting in are going in to mitigate exactly where the wetland buffer zone was, not sort of on the side. Our job here is to take the buffer zone and restore it as best we can in its, its natural functionality and its appearance and the density of trees to what it was before. We're never going to do that because you cut down a good number of 20 inch trees and we all know we're not gonna put any 20 inch trees in. So there's a lot of loss of wood there that we try and mitigate by replacing it. I just wanna make sure, and maybe I need to make a visit out there with you, Carl, in your diagram, uh, just to make sure that the area that is denuded of trees 50% is the same area as the green area on your map. You understand what I'm saying, Cara? And I, yeah. I, can't, I can't swear to that, because but I think that's the test that we have to we have to hold ourselves up to. I have represented the tree clearing to my best ability. I mean, okay. I was not present when the trees were there, um, so I this is 
I'm like doing detective work using aerial photographs. Um, okay. okay. And um, I've tried to depict the, the zone of clearance as much as possible. Okay, I, I, Jay, to answer your question is, I think they've probably done as best as they can at this stage. Okay, yeah. You know, Jeff and I went there and we said, well, if you look at the density, look at the size of the plot. Look at the, yeah. density of the trees surrounding. There are 20 trees that should go in here. And you're putting in 20 trees, Cara. So I have to assume that that's pretty close. And I have to be happy with that. You know, we, can, we can't nitpick too much here, all right? But please understand, I'm not satisfied I'm not satisfied with cutting down six 20-inch wide trees and replacing with, with six five-inch trees. That doesn't make me happy. And I wish the whole thing hadn't taken place. I think all the commissioners would wish that hadn't taken place. But, you know, um, you, can't, you can't put 20-inch trees back in, so we have our hands tied. Uh, to the last question, is there a time, uh, 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 hypothetically, if this project would have been approved tonight, if is there a time frame on the installation uh, or the, the getting going on the project? I know here we are mid November. So, um, what is the actual? What would be the proposed time frame on this project? Um, at this point, uh, the project wouldn't begin until next spring. Okay. When would you finish by Brendan? Um, we ha we have to put a time factor in here. Sure. Uh, it probably will take a matter of a couple of weeks. May? Part of it. May of next year, Brendan? I'm sorry. Um, the month of May? A April, April to May, sometime in that range, and maybe a two-week project. That's granted that the court has been installed. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> so the court, all of the court preparation has to be completely finished before any of the planting can take place. Any of the gravel removal, soil brought in, um, tree preparations. Um, after the trees are planted, the shrubs will be planted. I did not go over the shrubs. You know, we did pick a variety of native shrubs to go on the understory. Uh, winterberry, blueberry, clethra. Um, uh, and then also we have a native ground cover mix that will uh, that will be dispersed over the entire site, so that um, instead of weeds, you know, there will be a restoration of ground cover. Mix. So all of that will only be able to take place after construction has has been completed by the court. How long will the is the the tennis court facility going to take, and when do you expect starting that? They take up to two weeks, but I've had to get kind of at the end of the line again. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I can appreciate it, yeah. So they're also, they wait on the weather. So if there's not a lot of snow cover and the temperatures are right, they can bore. I have to get back to them after uh, when and if approved and then, then they can put me back in line and then I could update the committee. The commission. Cara, I, I, I think the issue here for you and your landscaping people is um, you have a, an extensive amount of landscaping here, uh, some of which is in fairly rough terrain. You want to have that done by mid-May next year, I would assume, all right, uh, in order for the longevity and the health of the plants and the grasses and the wild mixes that you're putting in. You don't want to do it in June and July. So I'm going to let Brendan answer this question. Um, Brendan has worked extensively at the Arnold Arboretum um, for much of his career, and he has um, experience installing meadows, maintaining meadows, installing um, new trees all throughout different seasons. Um, so I'm going to let him speak to that. Um, yeah, ideally, the planting would take place in April and May. Um, should it get pushed beyond that, um, you know, it's something that would just require obviously more, mostly irrigation uh, yeah. in order to make sure that the plants are viable. So yeah, ideally we'll be ready to do it in early spring. Um, if that's not the case, um, I, I think 
you know, it's, it's definitely still doable later on in the season. Um, although, you know, not ideal, but it is definitely possible. And, and we've done projects like that in the past in the summer months. Okay. One final question, Kara. To the best of your knowledge, were trees cut within the wildlife easement? Within? Within the wildlife easement. Um, not to because my if, knowledge. If they were cut, we expect you to put them back, even though you're not supposed to do any work in there. We would give you permission to put the trees in, all right, in a, in a limited amount of work to do that. If they were cut, I couldn't tell. Um, from my site visits, I could, it did not show that any clearance was, occurred outside of the property line, uh, which was the wildlife easement itself. And this was staked by the surveying team. Um, I did not see any evidence of tree cutting out in that area. Okay. All right. Commissioner, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I just have something. Um, so, give me one second here. So, the the person that's in the um, in the audience there under owner um, is, uh, I, I think it's Susan Holdley, but it says owner. Um, she asked that I read um, the email into the record um, that she sent us this morning regarding the issue of the zoning bylaw. So if you guys can just give me just a minute, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so it's an email, uh, let's see. So it says, uh, to, the to the Conservation Commission, Mr. Summers, Mr. Pampari, Mr. Egan, Mr. Chaddock, and Mr. Senior. Um, the, if, if approved by the Conservation uh, Commission, the project will require a permit for variance from the Cohasset zoning bylaws. Please see the attached four pages from the Cohasset zoning bylaw. They clearly show that the that the 11 11 20 proposal does not conform to the zoning Cohasset zoning bylaws in the following basic ways. It's a little long here, so bear with me. Page 24. Uh, Zoning table shows that properties in district BB requires a 20 foot minimum setback for other structure. The proposal shows a setback of only six feet. Uh, Seco asset zoning bylaw, page 24 attached. Um, page eight structure um, is clearly defined as swimming pool, tank, tennis court, tent, tower, trestle, and a tunnel. Seco asset zoning bylaw, page eight attached. Uh, page 23. Although the project has attempted to, def to define the 15 foot barrier as a fence, it does not meet the definition. C zoning bylaw page 23, a fence, a fence not in excess of six feet in height, a flagpole, a mailbox may be placed within the permitted setback attached setback distance for building on the lot. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your attention to this matter. We look forward to your comments at tonight's hearing, respectfully, Susan. Um, and then attached with that, um, she has the actual pages from the Cohasset zoning bylaw. Um, so I, I, I guess, you know, you know, unless Eric, if you want to address that, you know, I'll just say again that, you know, um, you know, we understand this, um, the, does, if this zoning bylaw is actually an issue, it, it will need to be taken up with, uh, with zoning. Um, and if zoning determines that the actual um, minimum setback is 20 feet, um, and then you know, they would have to come back uh, to you know, um, revise this project showing a, you know, a 20 foot setback. Um, so, you know, the, the Conservation Commission, as I said, you know, we're, we reviewed the, um, the stormwater permit, the mitigation plan, things, et cetera. Um, but that is an actual zoning issue um, that we really can't, um, you know, deny a project on because that's, you know, not within um, our, our jurisdiction to actually make a ruling on. So I don't know if anybody wants to add anything. So Jeff, um, I'd like to share my screen, actually. Um, if 
and you can see my email screen here. Yep. Um, I, this was an email that I wrote to Robert Egan on October 26th, or actually I wrote to him on October 23rd, just to um, clarify this issue. And on October 26th, he did write back to me. Um, in here, he did answer all of my questions. And I'm gonna, I'll just read them out loud. Um, so the setbacks were a principal structure or accessory structure over 15 feet in height are 30 feet from the front and 20 feet from the side of the mirror. The fence, not in excess of six feet in height, may be placed on, on the lot line. Um, a 10 foot fence would have to follow setbacks for any accessory structure, not in excess of 15 feet in height. There are no specific prohibitions for grade level landscape materials. A tennis court surrounded by a 10 foot fence, which is what we have proposed, is considered an accessory structure not in excess of 15 feet in height and may be placed no closer than six feet to the side or rear, provided that it is in the 100 foot setback from the front lot line. Um, so, um, and then here's a, two more bullet points. The 10 foot fence um, is what makes it an accessory structure. Any lighting features would have to be lower than 15 feet. Um, and so after I had cleared this with Robert Egan, I basically went forward to draw, to revise the landscape plan. Uh, I would not have done so without um, finding, making sure that this information was correct. Yeah, th thank you for, for reading that. Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> you know, like, like I'm trying to say, you know, we're the wrong board to be, um, you know, actually addressing the zoning issue. If that's, you know, it, 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 you know, the zoning would have to make a final determination on that. But if we approve a project, Jeff, mm -hmm. and substantial portions of it change in terms of the dimension and the position of the tennis court, we'll have to reopen the project. Yes. Yeah. I mean, if, if it's a significant alteration, I mean, uh, you know, if they can move the, the, the court back, you know, if this gets approved tonight and they can move the court back or, or, or make it smaller or something, it'll really depend on what the, what the, the alteration is. But yeah, I mean, it, it would have to be amended. Okay. Uh, however, I mean, if we approve this, it may give um, clearance to the, the, that board that would be okay to put the structure in. So perhaps it would be better to get that completely clear it up before we make a decision here because we don't want them to think that we approved on something that we weren't sure on that well, we had all the right facts yeah i mean it, it's i i don't so the process would be you know if they come before you know an applicant comes in gets all their the necessary permits before they apply for a building permit so this is one of the necessary permits so they come before the conservation commission to get their stormwater permit and their order of conditions for work in the buffer zone, then the next step that the applicant will have to do is file for a building permit. Then that's where the zoning issues can be brought up. You know, zoning knows that it's not our um, purview to make a decision based on a zoning issue. Um, so if when this goes forward and you know they, the applicant applies for the building permit, um, if it gets, if they, if the zoning board says, "Hey, you know what? That really does require a 20-foot setback," um, then actually, then, then you know, they would have to come back to us for revisions. But I, I don't think we need to wait for a zoning decision because it hasn't really reached that level yet. Nobody's asked zoning for, um, you know, a determination on this. They would, they would, they may be asked if, uh, you know, once a building permit is issued and somebody wants to contest that permit. Um, right. Jeff, there is something in the chat box. I just didn't know if you wanted to read it. Again, I think it's probably similar to um, what we've just been discussing about it not necessarily being conservation, but. Uh, yeah, so Steve is saying this is a ZBA and building inspector issue. Why is the commission discussing zoning? I think that, again, I wanted to bring this up from the onset um, to put into the record that there was a formal public comment from the public. And I think we, we have discussed it. Um, we've gone over it. 
we I don't I don't know that we've actually cleared it up, but we at least we have addressed it. We've let everybody know as far as what the Conservation Commission um, is understanding. Uh, it appears from what I'm looking at the screen here, Kara has had some communication with Bob Egan, our uh, zone enforcement officer, and, and the applicant has gotten some direction, at least uh, for clarification, at least from the zoning enforcement officer, whether or not you know we as a commission agree with that or not. It, I guess it really doesn't matter. Uh, I, again, it, it's out of our jurisdiction, but I'm glad that we're discussing it. I'm glad that we're putting it into the record. And I, I, I personally think there are some zoning issues here. So I would encourage the uh, abutter or any interested parties to, if this project is to be approved by any commission, that when a if an if a building permit is issued or under consideration, then that is the opportunity for the uh, for any about or interested parties to uh, to weigh in on that. But really, not so much tonight for conservation. But I'm glad we did put it into the record. I did have a question though, as far as the the lights go. In and in, in Bob's email, it talks about the lights being no more than 15 feet high. Um, how high are the lights here? Uh, in this project as far as being moved over? How high are the lights? Originally, they were 20 feet, but that was just a pick out something to put out for a proposal. I had no idea on height of lights or even if really we were going to put them in. They would be, I don't want to say rare, but very infrequent use is highly likely. So it would have to, okay. whatever whatever was allowed, if they get put in, is one thing. And then even if they get used, I would guess once a month. I'm I'm up at four, 4.30 every day. I don't plan on having anyone out there with lights light. <laughs> Keeps me up. Okay. I mean, it look, from what I'm reading, although it's pretty small print, it looks like the light fixtures um, would have to be lower than 15 feet high in general. Um, I noticed there was other another comment in the Q and A talking about uh, uh, lights as far as having uh, an effect on the abutting wildlife buffer. Jeff, we we had actually talked to Karis, I believe, about this. Do you want to uh, to put you on the spot here? Do you want to weigh in on that um, as far as Karis's re or town council's response as to whether or not we could uh, condition the lights? And regarding the aesthetics and having a an effect on the wildlife habitat area, do you remember that discussion? Um, yeah, so you know, I I, I, talk, I spoke with Karis, and again, she's our um, counsel for environmental, uh, you know, conservation commission issues. Um, my, my one of my questions to her was, can we regulate activities um, outside of the wildlife habitat easement? Um, based on the potential for effects within it. And um, so she read the, the actual easement um, document, um, which specifies activities that take place within the wildlife habitat easement area, such as, um, you know, it can't be disturbed, you um, can't bring any um, materials in there, et cetera, basically is to be left as is. Um, it was her opinion that we could not regulate activities outside of the physical easement area, that basically the wildlife habitat easement is defined by its um, geographic location only. And then, you know, activities outside of that physical area um, couldn't, be, couldn't be regulated based on the wildlife habitat easement being adjacent to it. Okay. Conclusion. Jeff, can you con conclude what you're, uh, you're summarizing there? So basically what I'm saying is, is that, um, you know, the, the, although the, the sport court is adjacent to the wildlife habitat easement that, um, we couldn't say that, no, you can't have it there because it's going to create light and noise that may affect habitat within the easement, easement zone. 
if that makes sense, yeah, if I can explain I that. I can see very on, honest in all the literature I've read of the uh, wetland-related wildlife, I have never run into anyone or any articles or information related to uh, severe detrimental effects on wildlife because of occasional spotlights. I think we're, we're talking about occasional spotlights. We're not talking about creating something which is a, a continuous uh, light source. So I, you know, I, I think we're on very thin ground, all right? If, if, we, uh, if we put our foot down and start uh, pushing um, the wildlife issue and the effects on it by something external, such as the occasional use of, of bright lights. I, I'm not even sure if the science would support that, Jeff. Um, that, yeah, that was basically her assessment too. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The, the, only, the only thing I just want to add to uh, the light discussion is um, it looks like in, in Bob's email here, which is still up, it, the light fixtures would have to be lower than 15 feet, if I'm reading that correctly. And I don't, I don't, I don't see on any of the plans, um, actual. I don't even see lights on the plan on the last plan that was submitted for that matter. So, I would, if this project were to be conditioned, I would like to see the plan revised to reflect um, lights. If lights are actually going to be used, and lights um, be at a height no more than 15 feet here. If in fact lights are going to be used, uh, I'd like to see that on the plan. Seems to be a topic of discussion. Well, I think 15 yeah. feet is excessive, so let's suggest maybe 10 feet. Well, I was going to say no, no, no greater than 15 feet. Uh, if in fact that is the, um, you know, I'm again just trying to look at Bob's email that's in front of us. Things that he has mentioned that are conforming and are not conforming. Let's try and look at that and say, okay, if Bob says X feet, then okay, but- um, Well, I agree yeah. with your condition that it should also be on, it should be on the plan. Everything should be marked. And if I may on that issue, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, the, they are shown on the site plan. There are four proposed light poles depicted on the site plan, uh, two on either side. They're basically on the east and west side of the court. Uh, again, facing east and facing west, uh, not facing the um, abutting can property to that, the north. Can we put that plan up? Because I, I don't see that latest. The latest plan that I, that I was looking at today did not have that on there. If I if I could maybe share my screen, I can probably show you that plan. If Jeff doesn't have my drawing um, queued up, um, I, I do. It, it yeah. Give me one second, and then I can do that. Okay. I throw in a quick question. Uh, one of the other neighbors, there's a tree house that is right against the property line. A tree that tree house, right? And some of the, I don't know how alive the tree is, but I don't think it gets used much. It'd be nice if it did. But when branches come across, I don't know if that's this commission or building and zoning. Yes. Yeah, I can. I, I don't think it's a wetland issue, Mr. Marchetti. The what? I don't think it's a wetland issue. So just build. So again, on this plan, you'll see the four lights. Uh, the the there you go. You got one there, there on the on the west side, and those two on the east side, facing in, obviously. And and clearly, he would uh, in, in installing these lights have to comply with the applicable maximum height limitations of the zoning. Um, I don't see where a hardship would exist to apply for a variance to get a higher light. So. In the end, uh, compliance with zoning is going to be uh, the case here for maximum height. And again, it would be limited to these four. And, and I think as the chairman indicated, it's a pretty infrequent occurrence where the lights will actually be utilized and on. Um, so I don't think it's a, it's a question of a lot of illumination for extended periods. Okay. But we're also talking about this current owner. We're, th we're also thinking about the future. So um, you know, even though we say that it may not um, affect the wildlife, let's try to 
And we have no scientific evidence to talk about how the lights affect the, the wildlife. Let's try to just reduce or try to make the, the lights a little shorter because um, this also applies for future if this house sells. What's your proposal, Marianne? Well, I, I would condition it that um, I guess they're not in excess of a 15 feet or I'd prefer that they were 12 feet or 10 feet. I think if you have a light that's less than 15 feet, you're essentially going to be blinding yourself. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think you'd be do able to play tennis out there at night with it that low. Hi, Jeff. This is James. Do, do we even have the authority to limit the height of a light no. fixture? I mean, wouldn't it be, I mean, I, I understand if the light fixture was being installed in the buffer area, but, but actually like telling them how high a light fixture can be in the placement of a light fixture, that would be a zoning issue. Not, not something that this commission would even be involved in the placement or the height of a light fixture. But isn't yeah, that yeah. part of aesthetics, though? Part one, uh, section yeah. one B. I, I think we're stretching. Think a that's, yeah, here. that's a reach, it's and right. I think that mm -hmm. Bob Egan already stated, you know, the zoning perspective. And if there's a problem with the lights, then it's something that they should be speaking with Bob Egan about, and then possibly appealing with the zoning board, but. That that has nothing to do with the conservation commission, and I, I think that's I don't know I think a little bit of a reach. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. I think um, you know conditioning it that they comply with all zoning regulations um, is perfectly acceptable, but I think getting into conditions on the design of something that's outside of the purview of the of concom is is probably not a great idea. Okay, I appreciate the discussion on that. Okay. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I like Heather's uh, recommendation about conditioning this such that, uh, and again, it's why I wanted to put it on the record. I wanted to get it out there. We've received some public comments and I'm looking at the Q&A as well. And there, there are more comments here with respect to the lights and et cetera. So while I agree that it's out of our jurisdiction, I think that it's certainly understandable to, to talk about it to get it on the record and make it clear that, um, that it's out of our jurisdiction. However, the applicant needs to consider all of the zoning issues when looking at this project. And while if this commission does approve this particular project tonight, we realize that there it may not comply with the zoning uh, bylaws. Uh, so I would, I would probably add a condition that the, um, that the project, uh, should conform with zoning bylaws, et cetera. <laughs> That's not taken for granted, Jay. I don't know. I mean, I, th I think we have beat it to the God, feet of the pie, all right? Swear by the American flag. Um, we're getting into areas here which clearly are not wetland related issues. And I, uh, from a legal viewpoint, if you do something that doesn't conform to basic laws in Cohasset, I, yeah, you're going to suffer, suffer the, the consequences of it. We can put it in, all right? There's no problem doing that. What else do we have, ladies and gentlemen? Any other issues, questions? I have a whole mess of conditions I want to go through. I went on the condition course at, at the, um, that we all had available to us, and I learned one thing. If you want it, you write it, you speak it, and you put it into the conditions. So I have a list of... 10 conditions here I intend to put into this project. And I'd like to hear if anybody has any others, because this is the time when you have a, a project which is very involved. We've spent a lot of time on this. If you wanna make sure something's gonna happen, put it in writing, make it a condition if it's a legitimate condition, all right? So um, I suppose we should, Jay, do we first move to vote on this or do we, do we assemble our conditions first? Well, uh, I've been in interested to hear your conditions. Um, I would just, I, I guess my question would be, um, without actually doing a little tally here, is whether or not any of the commissioners, um, you know, would would not support this project. Personally, I, I would support the project. I think Kara has done a a good job with uh, with the landscaping plan. It's a pretty robust plan. 
I know that uh, the landscaping company didn't have a lot to work with. There was some cutting that uh, obviously occurred some time ago. Uh, we've had three or four hearings on this now. The tennis court has been moved a few times. And I think that while we would all like to see larger trees back in there, you know, there's certainly, the, it's, it's not gonna happen due to the ledge and the tree roots, et cetera. But I, I, I would like to commend the landscape um, architect here as, as far as what was put in there to try to the best of the ability to mitigate that area. Although we would all, always like to see more, um, it is what it is. So, I mean, personally, um, you know, I with with your conditions, Eric, I'm sure I, I, I would feel the same way with so many conditions. I don't know if I have 10 of them, but uh, I, maybe I, if there are any other commissioners before I would make a motion, uh, if there are any adverse uh, opinions to the to approving this project tonight? Um, I don't have any adverse opinion. I did want to um, also point out and thank Kara and um, through Kara bringing on Brendan for taking um, and really listening to the feedback and, and taking um, the concerns of the commission very seriously. Thank you, Patricia. I would like to just add one thing, Cara, and um, I think I'd expect that you, and I'll, I'll make it a condition. We don't have a planting plan for the 20 trees that are going into the area uh, in the, the buffer zone. We need stakes and ribbons and ties indicating where the trees are going to go. That's how we handle these things, all right? I don't know when you want to do that, but we, you, know, you just don't go in and put trees wherever you want. You have to indicate to us uh, and show us where the trees are going to go. Yeah, I think uh, Eric. So you're, they yeah. were not on the planting plan. They they are. No, um, I'm okay. Then then maybe I'm misunderstanding. In the area, which is in the buffer zone at E, that goes to the right up to the wildlife easement. I was there two days ago with Jeff, and there's no indication there where the trees are going. We will stake before any of the trees are planted. We will. This whole area will be demarcated with flags. Everything will be, there will be ribbons, there will be marks. Um, okay. I, yeah. Could you make sure when you've done that that Jeff approves of that? That Jeff is involved? Yes, yes. We, okay. we talked on the phone and we discussed uh, uh, before anything is planted, Jeff will be on site with me and my team. We will ensure that all the plans are laid out accordingly. Um, into the best possible layout. Um, if there's leads, we will, you know, obviously we have to move things slightly to accommodate. But um, yes, we have to definitely going to be involved in the planting. Okay. Jay or Eric, I would have any concerns. I I would like to hear your conditions, Eric, before I make a right. decision. The conditions I propose, all right? Um, uh, the first is that there be 15 to 20 trees planted in the disturbed area of the 50 foot buffer zone and possibly in the wildlife easement area. These have to be native trees. They have to be randomly placed, probably most likely uh, white pine, I would guess, because the, the, the trees that were eliminated were for the most part white pine. Uh, if you cannot put 15 to 20 in, you must get the approval of Jeff, all right, uh, the uh, conservation agent for any any number less than that. I think that may be a problem because I think a lot of the area there you may find unplantable um, in terms of the good sized trees. Condition one, condition two, um, the trees to be planted should be two to five inches in diameter and planted randomly, not in a linear line. They should be randomly spaced out. Uh, all work in the 100 foot buffer zone, excluding the installation of a sports court and related apparatus will, will be done by hand without any use of heavy equipment. It's gonna be manual labor. If the trees will be bought in, wheelbarrows and this type of thing, we don't want any uh, earth moving equipment to go into the buffer zone or the easement area. Um, the soil of all non-built up buffer zone areas should be decompacted through hand tilling once the project is finished, to return the soil to its original condition, it's necessary to loosen the soil, certainly for the seed mixture to flourish. 
Once planning in the 50 foot area is completed, the area should be left totally undisturbed for a five year period. No one goes in, no maintenance. Um, and uh, this is necessary to allow your seed mix to flourish and to return the area to its original buffer zone flora. Irrigation of the new planting trees and seed mixtures will be necessary for at least one year. No fertilizers, soil additives, or pesticides will be used anywhere in the 50 foot area. All piles of sawdust, cut wood, and tree stumps will need to be removed from the buffer zone immediately. So that's what I have, my conditions. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. So um, you said once the once the um, planted area in the 50 foot buffer zone is planted, it's to be left undisturbed for five years. Um, one of our general conditions is that any mitigation plantings have to survive for three years. So um, if one of these trees die, it will need to be replaced. So that would kind of uh, we can make an exception for that, Jeff. The idea here is to return the area that's been pretty much clear cut to its original habitat value for plants and wildlife, which is just to have uh, unrestrained growth of the wildlife, of, excuse me, of the wild seed mixture, which you're putting in there, allow the natural flora to return uh, as it does, all right? Now, if something dies, Jeff, yeah, we can make an exception to that. I can. We can read that in as necessary, all right? Um, and then we have the condition uh, that the project and its detail, in, and in its detail, all right, is being approved based on the assumed conformity to Cohasset zoning regulations. And if problems are found by either zoning or any other permitting organization, uh, we'll have a chance to come back and review the plan and make uh, the changes necessary. Uh, may I ask a question? Yeah. Go ahead, Brendan. Thank you. Um, can you um, refresh my memory again on the, the sizing of the tree that you had just mentioned? Two to five inches. Two to five inch caliper tree, is that correct? Diameter? Diameter. Diameter. Um, the diameter of the trunk is, or the canopy? The diameter of the trunk at chest height. I think that's how you measure, where you measure it, isn't it? You have a standard height off the ground in Four your- Four and a half feet, measure. generally. Hmm? Um, generally for a, a forest situation, you measure the tree at four and a half feet off okay. the ground. That's fine. Um, but typically when you spec nursery stock, it's measured uh, as a caliper measurement. At the, at the root ball. Um, so the other condition that you mentioned was uh, regarding heavy equipment. Could you um, please reread that as well? No heavy equipment, very simple. Mm -hmm. No heavy uh, equipment. The issue here is going to be uh, being able to physically move trees of a uh, five inch uh, diameter without use of heavy equipment is uh, in my opinion, not possible. Mr. Chair, was that a comment about the no heavy equipment, was that related to within the 50 foot buffer zone solely? Well, no, uh, as I said before, um, this is this is excluding, all right, all the work being done on the, the tennis court and the development uh, section uh, on the property. So we're talking about in the 50 foot zone where in terms of planting for the most part, it doesn't pertain to the, um, the tennis court that's being put in. So would, would the heavy equipment, would that, would that be, uh, your, uh, it sounds like you're saying your, your condition would be that there'd be no heavy equipment within the 100 foot buffer zone altogether. I think. That, I mean, my, my comment back to that would be, I think that that might be a little bit stringent. I think that, um, I, I would re, I would re, I would clarify that to say that there would be no heavy equipment within the 50 foot um, buffer zone. Okay. I, I could I could buy off on that. I think there's there would need to be some um, a lot of digging, etc., in order to put in a two, three, four inch caliber tree. Um, so uh, I think for a time and 
you're going to have to remove those, uh, as you had stated earlier, removal of the trunks. Um, and just I, I would just limit that to the 50-foot buffer zone and not the 100-foot buffer zone as a condition. You in the 50-foot, Brendan? Or do you have the same problem? Um, regardless of the location, this, that size tree actually, first of all, is not commercially available. And also, if it were to be available, would not be movable by hand. Then maybe we have to go down and the, we'll have to, we'll have to reduce um, the diameter, I guess. Yeah, I, I can speak to the sizing of the plant material. Um, what, what we generally use for restoration plantings is, uh, it comes from a different nursery. It, it does not come from uh, a commercial nursery where you would buy plants, for example, for a foundation planting or a hedge screening in an area outside of conservation's jurisdiction. Um, these particular plants are measured in height, uh, not in caliper. And I think what we have is three to four foot height uh, it's uh, the information is on the plan in in regards to the sizing. Um, the but problem I had with that, Brendan, is that you've taken uh, not you, excuse me, uh, six or seven large trees. I count at least tw roughly twenty inches in diameter. And what we're trying to do is to repopulate this area as rapidly as possible with successful trees. All right, to make, get this area back to being its its natural habitat and floral value, all right? Given the fact that very, very large trees were taken down and they're all lying there on the ground, you can see them, all right? That's not disputable. So disputable. Uh, the idea is to push your people um, as far as possible in getting decent sized trees in there that will grow quickly without destroying with heavy equipment, bulldozers and tractors and all that, um, any further the, the wetlands. The whole thing's unfortunate, but um, you know we're trying to protect the soil and and the uh, the buffer zone at the same time. So I guess it's got to be up to you to make that that trade off. Yeah. Maybe we can say here. Yeah, I would agree. And our our standard caliper size for mitigation is a two to three inch caliper tree. I think a, a you know the commission, at least my personal view, a two inch caliper tree is you know ten to twelve feet high. Uh, you know, it, it, and that's, it's tiny, you know, you, you could certainly dig a two inch tree by hand, you know, a five inch tree, probably not, but, you know, we're talking about small trees here. Agreed. Um, even, even a two inch caliper tree, when you're talking about putting 20 of them in, digging that by hand is, uh, it, it's going to add a significant, obviously a significant amount of labor to the project. Um, the other issue um, and, and part of the reason that we did select the size trees that we, we've chosen is, is the lack of uh, available soil to actually, you know, place the root ball into. Um, with, with a tree that size, um, you know, it, I, I think everyone has seen the site. It's, it's at this point mostly rock. Um, a larger tree will also require um, a lot more water and, and the smaller trees will help us with that as well. Um, we won't be using as much of that resource. Um, with, with 20 two inch caliper trees, there's gonna be a lot more watering involved in, in knowing you know, there are watering restrictions and, and things of that nature. Um, the smaller trees will help with that. And also, again, with, um, you know, the lack of soil, it's, it's almost necessary to do that anyway. Um, another reason for planting smaller trees is in the event that some of them, one or a few of them do not make it. Again, to, to pull out a smaller tree and put, it, put another one back in uh, is going to be a lot less invasive of a process uh, than trying to come back in with another, you know, decent sized tree, um, especially if it's in far off the road, you know, way into the, the buffer zone or, or an area like that. Um, I, still, I still kind of think that it's, it's going to be really hard to plant trees of that size on this site. And I think that in terms of viability, 
you're, you're going to have better results with this smaller planting um, anyway. How do you measure results, Brendan? Just by survivability. Um, and, and again, as you mentioned, trying to, you know, get back the, the conditions of the site um, and, and get the biomass back in place that existed. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, um, I can't argue with you. I mean, I'm not a, a tree expert. I know I am, on my property, I have plenty of five inch trees that were bought in from arborists and, and, and from outsiders that have been very successful. And they're brought in wheelbarrows and there are about four guys doing it and a lot of digging. I don't see why you couldn't do that, but I, I, I do accept, I don't really accept the labor side. That's a cost issue. I accept the unsuitability of your terrain. The, the, you know, the fact that the soil is very limited, that there's a lot of a ledge there um, and that the survivability of larger trees probably is not going to be what you'd like to see it. So, Eric, I think if you're going to have this plan implemented in a, 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 a time frame, I think we need to allow some construction vehicles in there. I just I don't see how this large project, which is far larger than your property, could get done in time. Oh yeah, I I'm talking, yeah, we, I assume you have a good sized team of people working on this, Brendan. Yeah, we we do. I mean, again, when I spoke earlier, we mentioned a time frame of two weeks. That was assuming that we would have access to the equipment that we generally use. Um, I, you know, okay. <laughs> it's it's hard to get good labor these days, and as a company, we make up for that with uh, technology and equipment. I understand. Yeah, it's okay. I will change the proposal to uh, well, to the to the, the notion that we use as little mechanized equipment as possible within the fifty foot zone. Keep it to a minimum, um, and I'll, I'll leave the the judgment as to how much you use and where you use it up to you and your people. All right. And downsize the trees to something which you consider on the large side of of the smallest trees that you want to put in. Okay. Um, you know, and leave it up to professionals to take that decision, people like yourself. Anybody else have any, any other comments? I have a recommendation for a condition that the area is subject, subject to an inspection plan, a, an annual inspection plan, um, perhaps in May, to evaluate the success of the planting, um, survivability, and the biomass. Okay. I, I was yep. just going to add on to that a, um, I know not so much a, a, well, I guess it could be a condition and I've got a lot of conditions here, but um, prior to the start of the construction, at least like 72 hours prior to that our conservation agent be notified and not so much uh, hire a monitor, but Jeff uh, Summers, our conservation agent would be the monitor uh, of daily activities at the site or every other day or weekly, whatever it may be, while uh, the project is ongoing. So make it a point that um, that our agent is notified at least, excuse me, 72 hours in advance of the initial phase of the construction and that to make it a point that our agent monitors um, the landscaping activities. I agree with that. An inspection plan probably should go for three to five years. I don't know, yeah. like yeah. five years. Yeah. But, you know, Carl, let me emphasize, uh, you have to use Jeff as a, your sort of project consultant representing the Conservation Commission. He's the one the, with the authority to work with you and make changes and all that, all right? So you should have a very close working relationship during this project with Jeff, all right? Absolutely. Um, well, I, Jeff and I have talked about um, his involvement in the project. Okay. Any other thoughts? Any other conditions people would like to put forward? Uh, uh, just last, uh, last condition. Okay. Um, question, question for Jeff. Typically, our order of conditions are good for three years. Given the time sensitivity of time in trying to complete this project is it possible to condition the project for a one-year order of conditions now 
in a in a traditional situation where there is cutting that's that would have occurred we would have issued an an enforcement order or an administrative order here with uh, time frames on completion of the project putting that aside for various reasons um can we condition the approval of the project for a one-year order of conditions what do, what do you mean by one year the, the, what we're talking about will be completed within one year jay yes sorry well within one year of um you know january 1st 2022 for instance basically giving all of 2021 not putting any time frames on april may june july august etc you know conditioning the project or the uh, order of conditions. Again, typically an order of conditions is good for three years. Question is whether or not we could issue a one year order of conditions, condition it for a for one year. If the project does not start, if there's not a shovel in the ground by November 19th, 2021, then the applicant would need to refile a notice of intent. So Jeff, have we come across that at all? Um, no, and I, I don't think I could answer that question off the top of my head because we've never done that before. Um, but another option I'm thinking would be to just put a condition in there that there actually be, um, you know, I'm not so concerned about the, the installation of the court or the, the, the garden or the play area, but that the, the that the plantings be installed by say the end of, you know, December 31st, 2021. Um, and if they need to get the court, the playground, the garden area in before they can plant, then that's gonna be up to them to make that happen. Um, but, you know, I, I think the easier thing to do would be to put a condition in there for when the plants will be installed by, and then they'll have to work around that. I'm happy to add that condition. Okay. Do you want to uh, verbalize it, Jay? I just have a question on that. Yes, Mr. Marchetti. So if the governor declares everyone stay inside for the entire summer, <laughs> we might have to... COVID notwithstanding. Yeah. Um, joking, but half serious. I, mean, I, I, I would, Jay, I would assume that if, if there are changes in the work rules related to COVID-19 and various other things within the state, that we would normally alter our... Uh, our conditions and dates and timing accordingly. I assume I. Uh, you know, I, th I, think if, I, I think if there's some exceptional exceptional circumstance, like you just said, Dr. McKetty, I think that's yeah. something that you know we would obviously consider in in enforcing that specific condition. Um, you know, if the governor says nobody can leave their house for three months, of course it'd be unfair yeah. for us to, um, you know, keep to that you know, not, not give you a three months ex extension on, on that condition. Right. The, and the, and the, the order of conditions could always be extended uh, for a year anyway. Yeah. So I, I, I'm happy to, yes, go on record saying that given state guidelines, obviously the commission would, uh, would review that. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it's in the condition that uh, all the work has to be done uh, by December 31st of next year. I, I, I can live with that. Anybody have any, any thoughts on that or opposition to that as Jay recommended? I think you, you know, if, if things don't go your way, you could be hard pressed, Mr. Marchetti, to meet that timing, but you know. No, I'd like to get it done sooner. I know you do, yeah, yeah. And so it's, it's our purpose actually to make this project move as fast as possible and to make it a big success. I mean, that may not seem like that at times when we're talking, but we want the project to succeed and it's 100%, all right? Um, okay, Eric, those are the conditions. Jeff? I, I'm, I'm sorry, Eric, just to confirm that, or yeah. to clarify, are you saying that you want to have the entire project completed by the end of next year or just the plantings installed? I would say the project completed by the end of next year. It, it looks like the easiest part of the project is the tennis court, Mr. Marchetti, is it not? I believe the way they describe it, yes. It's yeah. And then you, then you have the landscaping. 
And to me, Jeff, that is just a question of getting enough people and the availability of plants. And there's a heck of a lot of planning going on here. All right. And I assume Cara's going to want to stick to the plants that she's thoughtfully put down on paper and not start making compromises. Um, and, and, and that in itself can be a big delay in completion. But um, I think we need to shoot for the end of next year. And if we don't quite make it, we can always, you know, compromise at that time. Okay. All right. So anybody want to make a motion? <coughs> I'll make a motion. Jay Pimpar, I'd like to make a motion to um, issue an, an order of conditions for the project at 76 Lambert's Lane with uh, I'm with the specific conditions as outlined by the chair in his previous remarks, which I didn't write down and I'm not going to have you go through again, but uh, your 10 conditions there with the additional condition on top of that, that the installation of the courts and the landscaping, et cetera, uh, be uh, completed by, I'll say January 1st, 2022. All right. Um, and also on the condition uh, of the approval of the zoning board and various other town committees. All right. Uh, we discussed that as a condition early on. Okay, let's have a vote. Anyone? We have a, is there a well, second? I'd also like to make sure that the inspection plan is included in that condition. You're right. Uh, that there's an inspection plan. Uh, Would you want to have it once a year, Marianne, at the end of the year, every 12 months? I think it should be once a year around the planting time. Perhaps it's May to look at the success of the planting and that they are, um, it meets the planting plan and its survivability. Okay. All right. Is there a second to Jay's motion? I second it. Okay. All right. Let's let's vote on that. Um, Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Patricia Grady. Patricia Grady, aye. Okay. Chris McFarland's recusing himself. Jay Pimpare. Jay Pimpare, aye. James Roseback. James Roseback, aye. Marianne Weatherald. Marianne Weatherald, aye. Okay, that's six in favor. <laughs> six in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstaining. So it passes six nothing. Congratulations, Mr. Marchetti. Now, I would, uh, we need, need need a little bit more here as well. Jay Pimpire would like to make a motion to issue a variance for work within the 50 foot buffer at 76 Lambert's Lane. Okay. I second. Right. We'll vote on the uh, the, uh, the variance to work in the buffer zone. Kathy Berrigan. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Patricia Grady. Patricia Grady, aye. Chris is recusing himself. Jay Pimpare. Jay Pimpare, aye. James Roseback. James Roseback, aye. Marianne Weatherald. Marianne Weatherald, aye. Okay. The proposal to issue a variance to work in the the buffer the 50 foot buffer zone passes six zero zero. And I, I think we have the stormwater permit as well. So I Jay Pimpari would like to make a motion to issue a stormwater permit for the property at 76 Lambert's Lane. Anybody second? I second it. Thank you. Um Kathy. Kathy Berrigan, aye. Eric Eisenhower, aye. Patricia. Patricia Grady, aye. Uh, Chris McFarland's not in it. Jay Pimpare. Jay Pimpare, aye. James Roseback. James Roseback, aye. Marianne Weatherald. Marianne Weatherald, aye. Okay, the stormwater permit passes zero, zero. He's cut it out for us. Right. Okay. What? I think that's it. Mr. Marchetti, thank you very much. Congratulations. You have a question. One question. Do you need a variance if we were putting trees along that easement line as well, or is that? I'm sorry. Uh, trees along the easement line, the wildlife easement? Right. I, I didn't know if some of those were like a foot or two in as suggested before by Jay last meeting. 
I, I think we've already covered the var the variants would cover that. Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Anybody have anything else to add? Mr. McKinney, congratulations. Thank you. It's it's been a long slog, but it ought to be a very great project. And uh, I hope you're happy with the result and get some good tennis games out of it. <laughs> well done. Okay. Good night now. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Look is there a, just is there any of the attendees there with their hands up, Jeff? I don't know if you're monitoring the Q and A. Um, just owner, but I think that was up from before. I don't see any new questions. I mean, there's some comments here about the, you know, some uh, Steve typed in stuff about the root, the caliper yeah. and root ball size and stuff like that. And yeah, yeah, yeah I think we had, yeah, it looked like we addressed all the Q and A stuff, right? Yeah, except for the comments of, you know, how large can a tree fit in a wheelbarrow, and why are we discussing zoning issues? I didn't, I didn't answer any of that stuff. You can get an awful big group on a big wheelbarrow, get some big guys pushing it, but who knows? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, next subject is... Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Conservation agent update. Eric, you uh, wanna just uh, formally continue to December 3rd, the Atlantic Ave and, and Dolan Lane projects. Oh, you're, you're a good reminder, Jay. Thank you. Hey, I don't, I, I don't want to get sued here. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, NOI 2020 for 183 and 187 Atlantic Avenue, the boardwalk by Mr. Fernando. That's being continued to the 3rd of uh, December this year. And the NOI 20 21 stormwater permit 2029. For Lot C, Dolan Lane has also been continued uh, to the 3rd of December of this year. All right. Okay, Jeff, you're on. Do you have anything? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention, you know, we, we talked, we were talking before at the last meeting or the meeting before about um, having <clears throat> the, um, so when there's a continuance, we ask for uh, revisions, having those submitted earlier. You know, usually we would wait till, you know, the, the Tuesday before the meeting to have them give us our revisions. And then we were kind of floating the idea of making it the Friday uh, before the meeting. But actually, you know, it's, it's already in the regulations. So it's, it, you know, it's interesting when, you know, the more you read the rules and regulations, the more you find and the more you forget and then refine. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually in here. So, you know, under continuances, it says, um, all continuances must be to a specific date. If, the, if a continuance is granted due to uh, amendments to, to the project proposal, revised site plans um, shall be submitted and re revised site requirements put in place seven days prior to the next hearing. So that's always been in there. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I read that at some point, but forgot it was there. Um, so it's already in there. So yeah. I think going forward, you know, when we have a project and it gets continued, we can say, hey, look, we need to have your revision submitted to us by the end of the following Thursday. That would give, that would be seven days advance. Yeah. Um, which uh, means the Friday, the which means the Friday, Jeff, which technically means in a lot of cases means it's not available until Monday morning. Correct. Uh, well, so I think we can make it that Thursday because it'd be Thursday, Thursday okay. Friday, Saturday. So I think the Thursday would be the seven days okay. before right. the hearing. So the end of so the end of uh, business on Thursday would give us Friday to then you know uh, put I'm everything on OneDrive, put it on the on the on the website for um, abutters to to view. Um, so I think that's what we should go do going forward. I, I in, the re, the reason I think that's worthwhile doing is I think you're all busy. You have jobs. You're traveling somewhat, um, and we have abutters. We have other people uh, who need to to access this information. And the more time we can give to people like yourselves to thoughtfully think about uh, what we have uh, in front of us, uh, the better decision taking capability we're going to have. And this gives us more time. And I I don't think there'll be many cases. Uh, where once the system gets organized, the people who are submitting the projects will be having a problem doing it. They just, they just have to gear up for uh, doing it a bit sooner than later. So, and like I, as Jeff said, 
it's part of the rules and regulations right now. So, okay. yeah, I think every, I think everybody would wait till the to the Monday before and then redo their site plans and stuff, and then see if they can get a test by the end of Tuesday. So at least you know this way they'll know that they have to, uh, okay. you know, have it in a week before. Can I say something? Yes. Um, I think if we do it on Thursday and say someone calls and says, can I get them in Friday morning? And we could make exceptions in certain cases and that would still give us ample time. Do you know what I mean? I think the Thursday is good. And what I can also do when I, when I um, put together the schedule for 2021 with meetings and such, right now we have a deadline to apply for a meeting. I can also include in there deadline also um, for continuing hearings to be submitted, something to that effect. And then I send that out to everybody that deals with us, like Morse, um, Cavanaro, all the engineers. And they would know not only is the deadline for the meeting two weeks ahead, but a deadline for additional paperwork in yeah. a continued meeting is a week ahead. And I can specify that to all of them so then they have no cause for recourse. Okay. No comments? Great. Let's go, Angela. Fine. Oh, I'm done. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, what else? Chairman's issues? I have nothing to bring up right now. Does anybody have anything else they'd like to have us discuss at this moment in time? I, I was just going to mention, too, that uh, th th this, this isn't set in stone yet because um, the governor may veto this. But um, so I think, uh, as everybody knows now, that um, the 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 um, the deadlines for the commission to act are usually 21 days. So if somebody would file a permit application, we would have to make a decision or, or uh, within or review it within 21 days. Um, so everything's been tolling. Um, you know, enforcement orders have been tolling all those dates. Um, and originally everything was gonna to be tolling until 45 days after the COVID emergency was lifted. Um, but there was, a, there was a law update that I received yesterday that said um, that the, legisl the legislature amended um, the, the relevant provisions of chapter 53 um, to the changes of the tolling period to December 1st. Um, but, it, but it does say the governor has to sign it still, so it is, it's not um, in force yet. But those tolling periods may end December 1st, but we're not, we're not sure exactly quite we're yet. Going, we're going back most likely to our 21 days. Yeah. Yep. yeah. <clears throat> okay. And anything that was uh, during the tolling period, Jeff, um, has to be done by December 1st. Is that it? Uh, yeah, so we would have to. We're all we're all caught up in everything because we've been actually holding the hearings. Hearings, but you know, from what I understand, some towns haven't reviewed anything. So I don't know what they're going to do. <laughs> yeah, the only thing I wanted to add to that is a. Um, yeah, right. We haven't continued every. We've continued everything. We've done great with holding these meetings. We haven't had to. Um, to tell people that their applications are on hold, et cetera, as I found out uh, many other towns are, haven't been holding meetings actually since March, which is very troubling, but we've held the meetings. The only thing we have left outstanding uh, is the Rustway order of conditions. Yep. And due to the tolling process, um, typically, as you know, uh, any order of conditions has to be issued, signed, et cetera, within a 21 day time frame. The Rustway denial order of conditions um, Jeff uh, and I drafted, and Jeff, thank you for uh, your extensive work and looking at getting into some of the details of it. Um, we drafted it. We have sent it to uh, town council. We had been waiting most of the time for town council to actually get back to us. Um, town council has gone back to us. We've gone back and forth. Long story short, it is now draft final. Um, Jeff is making some just last minute um formatting changes to it and hopefully the new chair eric will sign that tomorrow and so once that's signed off if uh jeff if you could email a copy of that to all the commissioners um 
to just review that is not for deliberation. It's just for reading purposes only. And the actual denial order of conditions will get recorded, uh, sent to the applicant, and then we will sit back and see what steps, if any, take place moving forward. But it's not for deliberation, just to let you know that the final denial of order of conditions should be uh, should be final, hopefully tomorrow. Great. Come a long ways. Thank you very much, Jay. Hi, Eric. This is James. Hey, um, James. I, I just wanted to make one comment. Um, a lot of towns have pretty lengthy um, decisions, and they have general conditions. Um, and I, I think, you know, if there's specific conditions that you think are a good idea, then maybe it's something that we should put together and just make them general conditions that apply to everything as far as a silt sock and stabilizing any bank and, you know, minimum caliper on trees and not using equipment in the 50 and, you know, maybe some of those things should just be blanket conditions that are attached to all decisions from the commission. I mean, the, the ones that come out of Norwell are like 40 pages long and they tell you what you can and can't do pretty extensively and it will save, you know, having to, you know, add conditions to each individual one and also keep it consistent so people have an idea of what they can and can't do. And these are standard forms, James? Like Yeah, so if you, general, for I mean, I'm sure Jeff can probably ask um, you know, for a copy, but if you look at other towns that are, um, you know, their conservation commissions are pretty in depth, the decisions that are issued come with a packet and they have standard conditions and they go right through everything from, you know, disturbing a bank and making sure that it's stabilized during construction, using a silt sock, not working outside of the area that's yeah. described in the site plan, and it'll just go right down and have a whole bunch of standard okay. conditions. Yeah, James, we, we actually have, um, so there's 20 standard conditions that the state issues with every order conditions. And then yep. we have an additional, um, it's usually 30 or 32 conditions, just like you said. Um, like uh, the ones that Eric mentioned here, you know, are kind of unique to this, um, the project, you know, Lambert's Lane, but but we we do have that. There's usually an additional 30 to 32. Like you know, Eric said that um, you know they should notify the agent 72 hours before they begin work. That's actually already in there. Yeah. Um, just you know, just for an example. Okay, so it's already we're done. Yeah, I can I can send you. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll actually email you a copy of that. That what do you think, is, Jeff? We could we could have uh, expand our standardized form adding more to it and, and uh, you know, covering more, more individual issues in a standard way? It may be something worth looking at because I, I just feel like, you know, a lot of times it comes up as far as what's acceptable for marking trees and how big a caliper they should be and whether things need to be dug by hand. I mean, you know, James, I, there are a few things we have done. Uh, two years ago, I put together our, our native tree list. And, yep. you know, up, up until... Prior to that, everything was everything that came in. They had no idea what was native. Everything was chosen by grandmothers and all that. So we standardized that, and that's that saved a lot of time. And most of the engineering companies are happy for that. If we can do anything else, let's give it a try, Jeff. All right. I, uh. Yeah. No, that's what I was going to say. I'll send it to you know. I can send it to everybody if anybody has any comments. Yes, please. Send it back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, a quick question. I know uh, tonight went probably longer than most people thought it would. And seeing that we have three con uh, hearings that are already continued, and I imagine there'll be some lengthy discussion on at least two of those. Have we got any uh, new, uh, just preparing myself how much I need to drink for December 3rd? <laughs> what else has come up? We have, the night before, we have huh? two additionals. We have two new additional um packets in the, the three continued and two new public hearings so we have five so we'll have five on the agenda okay could, um, be, a, could be a late night yeah, yeah maybe, maybe one's, a big drink jay one's another dock project and another was a knockdown oh, rebuild 
<laughs> yeah, I love docs too. <laughs> I know. Okay. Hey, uh, Jeff, do we need to, uh, I know there was a category one stormwater permit. Do we need to formally approve that or can you do that on your own? No, I do that on my own. It, it, it was on the one drive for last meeting in case I may had any comments. All right. So that's been approved? Yes. Great. Okay. Jeff, can we can we make a point at the beginning or maybe a couple times during a meeting, depending on who signs on as an attendee, to get them to uh, put their their full name into the record? Yeah. Because the 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 uh, you know it was getting a little out of hand tonight. With with Steve. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is that really his name? I'm not sure. Uh, I know who it is. <laughs> well, I think it was the uh, there was somebody signed in as owner. Yeah. yeah and I only was... yeah that that was Susan Holdley, and I only determined that through a deduction when she was asking about her email. Yeah. Right. Official policy, Jeff, uh, that people have to sign in with their full name and address or this type of yeah, thing. Well, it's not a policy, but they should. Yeah, but I don't think as an attendee, I think it comes up depending on what email you use. Uh, yeah, but I think you can. I think you can change it. Just like when you sign on as a participant, you can change your name. Oh, I can spell my name correctly. Yeah, yeah you can. I, I can spell your name incorrectly. Yeah. Anyone yeah, like submit a public if comment? You, if you right-click on your image, and one of the things comes up is rename. You can change your name. Oh, there you go. Yeah. yeah. But but I, like, I like being having the wrong name. name. Is it possible? If you want to submit a public comment? You need to state your name and address yeah. for the record. And most commissions, at least the select board, won't even acknowledge your comment unless you have your full name and address for the record. So I know it's a little difficult sometimes when we do the Zoom stuff, but you know when, when, when we're in person, the first thing we do is we say name and address for the record. So we could certainly put in the chat box right at the beginning of each meeting that each chat should be followed with your name and address. It might help because we can't fix the names that people put on there. Yeah, no, no, that that's a great idea, Chris. Yeah, at the beginning when we go through a little spiel okay. about using the Q and A, you can just say, "Look, you got to put your your full name," and probably you can even type in par partially addressed to, or else what? we're not going to, you know, uh, entertain their, their comments. You take care of that, Jeff. Then yes. Okay, I'm going, I'm going to dinner. I think. <laughs> How's everyone? Anything else to, to be brought up? Okay. Uh, Move so to close the meeting. The hearing second all uh all in favor say aye raise your hand come on, raise your hand aye. there we go aye. okay we got a full yeah thank you everybody we'll see happy you on thanksgiving. Uh, happy, happy thanksgiving yeah happy thanksgiving yeah. everybody happy thanksgiving happy thanksgiving. Bye, bye. thank you all right so long everybody bye bye bye